Welcome back for week two. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll take the sound off. So you won't stop making noise if I can. Um, in fact, let me just turn off Zulip. I'm not looking at Zulip since other people are instead. Um, great. Okay, good. So, uh, so welcome back. Uh, for, and I just want uh, so things seem to be working better technologically, although nothing nothing is perfect. So. Uh, let me uh, first uh, start by just sort of saying where we are and reminding you that this is not a lecture. This is and uh, this is not supposed to be where all information happens. So what I want to do is tell you uh, it, is to sort of set the stage for reading and problem solving and things like that. But for with only one hour a week, it's not going to be uh, all I can do is that, and that's what I, that's what this is really should be for. So that uh, so today I want to continue doing that, but I want to start by letting you know where we are and where we seem to be. So as a reminder, this is like the group of people who are here are uh, extremely widely distributed in terms of not just geography, but in terms of what you know, uh, and the time you have and your backgrounds and your fields of interest. So, uh, but now that a week of things have happened, I, I, I've been able to wander through Zulip and see various things happening in groups. And I think Lots of good stuff is happening, and the people who are talking to each other, I feel like everyone is talking to each other. We can keep uh, is on the train, and uh, we can keep on going. And our and the goal for the summer is going to be not to prove a deep theorem or anything, but it's to basically set the stage for understanding what a space is and how we do geometry. So that's uh, so that's the goal, and uh, and at the end of it, hopefully you'll understand some things you understood before maybe a bit better and sometimes uh, maybe you'll understand some things that are actually new. Okay, so let me uh, so let me start by trying to uh, say a little bit about this week and then get into actual math. So uh, the things to read this week uh, will be roughly the first three parts of chapter two. Uh, and for homework, uh, what I'm thinking is that the problems from last week uh, the problem should hopefully have two weeks of, of thinking about. Uh, it makes sense to not have them be permanent ongoing. So let's say it's the second week of, of the problems from last week. So you, you might have new ideas. Uh, you might uh, be able to uh, answer questions you could, didn't before, or maybe you're only halfway through thinking about them. Uh, and then we'll also start, have, I'll add some new problems later today. Uh, and uh, great. And Shepherds, are you, you're watching stuff so you can bellow if there's something happening that, um, that, that I should know about. Oh, hi, Quinn. Uh, OK, so uh, great. So now, before getting to what we talked about last week, let me just point out some things to remind you how we're thinking. Uh, so one thing to remember is that when you learned linear algebra, you, uh, when you learned linear algebra, it changed the way in which you looked at the world. Uh, and, that's, that's, uh, and you don't remember that. Uh, most likely, which is that somehow whenever you think of a mathematical problem, you immediately think about how the, uh, you turn it into something linear algebraic. You, you, calculus makes sense only when you understand that it's about linear algebra, uh, as if you're beyond one dimension. Uh, and a related thing is the notion of proof, which probably happened around the time you learned linear algebra, maybe a few years earlier or a few years later, uh, which is once you know what a proof is, and not just read a proof, but make your own proofs, uh, then you uh, then it changes how you understand the nature of truth, especially in things like the rear of sciences like mathematics. And in particular, you must know for the for the ninety percent of you who are comfortable with proofs that what uh, that what matters is that you make a proof, not that it's the ideal proof from the book. You don't say my proof's wrong because it's not the ideal proof. You you have to actually construct proofs yourself to really understand something. Uh, and so that's the way in which I want you to think about category theory. I'd like to say something which may offend some people, but maybe none of the people here, uh, which is that I feel like you should never take a course in category theory. And maybe you did, and then I'm sorry, uh, and I'm sure it was a wonderful class. But, uh, uh, but the reason you shouldn't do take a course in category theory, it's like if you want to learn to play a musical instrument, uh, you shouldn't spend a year you know, understanding the like how, how it how it works and how to push the keys before you actually start, you know, blowing into it. If you're if you play piano, this may be a metaphor; it doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so, so category theory is something that it, it is really important. It changes how, and it should change how you see things. 
uh, but uh, it's incredibly dry if you don't connect it to anything. Uh, so, uh, and it's incredibly, what's the opposite? It's very wet if you, uh, uh, if, it, if it actually is, if you uh, see it in, 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 when you see it in light of other things. And just like with linear algebra, with category theory, when you see a new concept, you just find yourself asking certain questions uh, and noticing commonalities that you would not have before. Okay, so uh, maybe as a linear algebra warm up uh, to get, uh, I might as well mention a, a problem that's uh, that is one of my uh, that's one of my uh, favorites to give in uh, because it, when you think it through, there's like an aha moment. Although it's somehow very, in some sense it's very easy, in some sense it's really deep. So, okay, here's the linear algebra question. I'm gonna write down a bunch of equations in, uh, let's see, let's do 26 unknowns. Uh, uh, that's how many letters I, I have at my disposal. So you have like, there's a bunch of equations and they all have integer coefficients, say just for simplicity. And I'm gonna write a whole bunch of equations. In fact, there are 108 such equations. And so I've got a bunch of equations like this and I will, and I'll tell you a solution. It turns out that there is a solution. Uh, if you let me write them down. So if you carefully solve this and take some time, you'll realize that there's a solution and the solution is 14 comma pi comma nine comma uh, root two comma and so forth. And my question is prove that, or, or tell me why it's not true, that there's also a solution, a solution in ra the rational solution. So if you're bored uh, and you've seen some things before, you, uh, then you can think through why this is. Uh, and I like it because there are many different ways of saying what it is, but it's always the same insight. Okay, uh, so, and that's something where if you think linear algebraically, this is, there's some reasons why this is very comprehensible and there's, but if you've never had a linear algebra class and never learned to think that way, it's very mysterious. Okay, so let me get back to, let, let, let's get back to where, uh, where we were last week. So, so here are the questions people asked a lot in different contexts over the uh, last week and over the course of the week. So there's, I guess, the question that, that, uh, that I asked, which is sort of, what, what is a manifold? And I should try to get across what I mean by this. And many people answered it in the question, in this sense in which I meant it, which is, it isn't go to the web and look at Wikipedia and look up the definition and say what it is. It's, uh, it's more that what you should want to do is, uh, is to actually uh, just sort of have, uh, know what it is that you're trying to describe. Here's maybe a manifold with corners or with boundary. Uh, and so it's the, the, it's the, it's the pre-definition. And even without defining what a manifold is, we already have it as an example of how to think about things. Uh, and so we don't know, so maybe I'll say that we as a group don't know what a manifold is yet, but we know what we're in some sense what we want it to be. And in some sense, well, I'll, I'll wait until I get to the end of the slide we're saying more. Uh, and then some people when uh, asked this very, uh, asked about uh, a lot of people wanted to know what a stack was. And after thinking about it, I realized, realized I, I felt bad about it and related to what is an orbifold. Because I felt like you shouldn't, the people who are asking mostly had no business asking. And I feel like you're not, they, they had uh, in the following sense. And I, I'm afraid you're gonna take this the wrong way because I, I mean this in a somewhat satirical way. but. Uh, why are you asking? If you have no, if you don't know why you're asking, then then you have work to do before that. If you're just curious, that's okay. I'm I'm okay with that, and I will later tell you what a stack is. Uh, uh, a dangerous thing is that it's a really powerful, useful notion, and you want to say and uh, and you don't just want the definition. You really want to know sort of why is a stack um, uh, before. And if you can't tell me why you want to know. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I will try to tell you why you want to know, uh, and then I'll, maybe I'll and then I'll tell you what it is. Okay, and and a, and a related question is that came up that was I intended as a guiding question for the uh, for the summer, and and it's really the comments and questions were I should say the questions that were asked about it were I wanted to answer them by saying yes, that's the right question. So uh, rather than answering the question because the, the questions get at the, the meat of what it is. So if you were to, for example, consider all Riemann surfaces of genus three. So there's, that's a, a nice picture of it. And like, what do I mean by that? Well, I, for the purpose of trying to understand what this, what this question is, 
Uh, I don't really need to tell you yet. We'll worry about that later. But you know that there's some notion we're trying to capture. Uh, and once you see what they are, you might say, OK, we have a set of such things, uh, which are uh, which is we'll call M3 uh, is the that's the, the name for this that's given to this thing. And it's a set. But it should be somehow wanting to be better than a set. Uh, and so I gave you uh, an imperfect, uh, maybe uh, I should say, I gave you a perfect explanation with imperfect meaning of the words, uh, or, which I guess counts as an imperfect explanation of what this, of what, what we should want to mean by this, this phrase. Uh, and so the questions people were asking, which I'm not going to repeat because you have, you can go look on Zulip, or but I feel like you have to be led to ask them yourself, such as what is a fa what's a family? What do I mean? How do I endow this with some structure that's better than a set? And I said, if you have some family of such things parameterized by some base, that should give you a map from your base to M3. So I said that, but all sorts of words, what I said, had no meaning yet. What do I mean by a family? What do I mean by, well, I guess, roughly speaking, what do I mean by family? That's the thing. What's a nice family? So all I want you to do if you're curious about this and interested is don't give up on the question like, and try to nail down uh, and we'll keep talking about what that is. Okay, so then here's my next example, which is what is projective space, which is uh, really somehow an example of all the previous ones. It's a manifold, it's a modulated space, it's a stack, it's an overfold. Uh, and so, so what is projective space? Well, uh, in so what's, what's say P2 or P2, uh, one answer, one first answer could be it's the set of uh, lines in R3 through, uh, through the origin, one dimensional subspaces. So that, so that's a set of such lines. So that's a, that corresponds to a point in my projective space. That's another point, that's a third point. And so it's a set, but it wants to be better than a set. And many of you, long before you know what manifolds are, know what coordinates should look like in projective space. You might've seen it, uh, but what right like why are those God-given coordinates? Like why is, uh, so uh, maybe I will, I should pick a field and I will always prefer the complex numbers and maybe if, right over the real numbers and maybe I'll later say why the real numbers frighten me but the complex numbers don't. Uh, and so, great, so there's what is projective space. And if you think about this question in different ways, it's uh, really an example of, it is a modulized space and you want it to be a manifold. And then more generally, be, uh, let me just talk about a Grassmannian as a more a general version of projective space, just because it gives us an excuse, if you know projective space, to see something richer. Uh, so what's a Grassmannian? Well, it's another, if, if projective space is one dimensional subspace in n plus one space, if that's projective n space, the Grassmannian is going to parameterize k-dimensional linear subspace of n-dimensional space, uh, complex numbers your field of choice. Uh, and that, and then the language, uh, and then the language we'll use for that is, or the notation is GKN, k-dimensional subspace. And once again, uh, you can picture that's like a, it's a set. Like you have a picture. Um, there's n space. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Let me draw n space. Uh, how do we draw n space? Uh, we draw n space. There's n space. Uh, it's, oh, there we go. Yeah, that's good. There's n space, and you're parametrizing two-dimensional subspaces of it, and you're, and as you, you can imagine, moving it around. And of course, the picture is garbage. But of course, also the uh, uh, it's not garbage because because you speak, breathe, and live linear algebra. You know what I'm trying to say, and so the picture then encodes what I want to say. Okay, so these are all kinds of, and once again, this is an example of all those of all those things uh, above. And now, finally, let me. Uh, so I I want to answer. I want to figure out. You know, all these questions, including what is the stack, uh, is uh, uh, is it, are in the same family. And, and so I'm going to start with like a really easy one where you really know the answer, which is what's an open subset of C to the N, or maybe if you prefer um, of, of R to the N, if you want to just picture it this way. Uh, oh, maybe I should have also said that uh, this is that P N minus one is G one N by definition, if you want to see if you understand, if, if you want a reality check. Okay, so what's an open subset of C to the N? You already know what that is in some sense, but my point is you know what that is and you don't know what anything else is. So how do you understand everything else in terms of the one single thing you understand? Uh, since everything else has something to do with, with this. You want to say a manifold, as many of you have already said, 
is something which looks kind of locally like that. And we have to make that precise. Uh, and this is something which is trying to be that. This should be locally like that and so forth. Okay, and then, okay, we're still some way away from saying something new, but the tricky notions from last week's reading that people talked about were, uh, were universal properties, limits and co-limits and adjoints. And now I guess part of this is all those three things are things that you should start to see everywhere if you can. You'll see, wait a second, that's a limit. Or, oh yes, that satisfies a universal property. And then you also know a lot of words, which you don't have to read on the screen, uh, but, uh, but hopefully you have a list of words that you uh, have seen now. And uh, it's a lot to memorize, so don't memorize them, but you should know all the notes. But the notions should either already be familiar to you or you should make, somehow make them familiar. Uh, and then you don't have to memorize them up. And, uh, so, uh, and so the only things to really remember, uh, well, there are lots of things to really remember, but for a limit, uh, again, if you have some diagram uh, uh, and you, uh, you, a limit is something which maps to it uh, and it's universal in that way. So anything else mapping to it must factor through that. And then it's the same deal for a co-limit. And uh, uh, so in particular, the, the things I remember is when I want a limit, I don't want to just remember the universal property. I remember, I want to know how to think about it. And so if you have a limit, that means you give what you have something in each one of its ingredients. Uh, and so uh, for example, if you have a formal power series, you can, you can get a degree n polynomial for any n by just looking at the first n terms. Uh, and, uh, and similarly, mostly, basically with mild lies, any element, if you want a co-limit, well, any element inside of, of one of these things gives you an element of the co-limit. And there are all sorts of ifs, ands, and buts there, like who, who said these were sets? They're not necessarily sets. So that's, uh, and, uh, and secondly, there's like some, there's an issue of, of co-final, the co-final condition, but ideally you should just think, ah, yes, that's, we need the co-final condition because otherwise dot, dot, dot. So, so make them both universal properties, which are abstract and concrete things. And with adjoints, the only things I want to say after you've read it is that for me, still adjoints are surprising notions. Limits and co-limits I can deal with. Uh, like I, can, I feel like after the fact, they make a lot of sense. It's very clean. To me, I feel like uh, you have, it's, it's really, this is kind of unexpected. And so I don't know how to think about it in a super good way. Uh, but formally I can say something. And the kind of notion that's going to come up repeatedly is things like groupification or how you make negative numbers if you know about positive numbers. So, and just as an example is that given an integral domain, you can get a field, uh, which is the fraction field. And you can, and here's an example of revisiting it in, the, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of what, uh, in terms of sort of adjoints, which is if you, you can have a map as integral domains from, uh, from an integral domain to a field. And that's the same as taking a map from its fraction field, its field of fractions to the field itself. Uh, and so that's a case where in this case, you're, you're treating using the fact that a field is an integral domain. And so you're forgetting that it's a field and just remembering it is an integral domain. And here you're turning the integral domain into a field and you have to do something to it. So if you have that example in mind, then you'll know that how to make sense of this following sentence that forgetful functors, what is, uh, this is not a precise statement, but in all examples you do it, you'll be able to make sense of it. Forgetful functors, are they left adjoints or right adjoints? And the answer is from this example that really here you're forgetting K is an integral domain, is a field and it just has an integral domain. So it's a functor on, it's a, it's a right adjoint. So that's the kind of thing you, it's good to make friends with. And so you just remember with that. And then I guess for experts, this is something that I wish I knew earlier. Uh, uh, well, I do know it now. And actually, one of the great things about this is in Zulip, in one of the groups where there are a lot of people who think topologically, Jason Bell uh, 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 mentioned Rappel. Uh, and I also forget which ones, the adjoints and limits. And it's right adjoints reserve limits. So I will always remember Rappel. And that means I know that right adjoints preserve limits. And therefore, I know left adjoints preserve co-limits. And limits commute with limits, which is very believable. Um, great, uh, good. So now let's get to actual, so now we're actually 20 minutes into the hour and only now are we talking about new things, but that's okay because we'll spend the start of the week after talking about this too. So, okay, so today what I wanna do is get across 
the notion of what is a, of, of why is a sheaf or what is a sheaf, or in other words, examples of sheaves and then realize, abstract away and then realize that other things are sheaves too. And then we'll see once we make the definition, we'll see that they come up again and again and again. And in practice, what happened is topologists in, I don't know, the 1930s uh, realized this is the right way to look at the world. And then other people like algebraic geometers started to, were completely convinced of it. So, so the example, you, yep, sure. You uh, update the slides on Dropbox? Oh my gosh, thank you. That is, a, remind me repeatedly, because that's, uh, I will yep. keep forgetting. Every time I turn the page, I should do this. Yep. And then refresh. Uh, and I'll give a second for people to actually see the updated things. All right. And I did, fortunately, I remember to record, because that's something I've forgotten to do in other situations in the past. And you can't go back and undo that. Cool. Okay, is it up, has it updated? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll let you know. I'll let you know yeah. if anything. Yeah, works. do complain. Do like really do complain about anything because I I really wouldn't notice it, uh, and I'll be distracted. Okay, so I want to try to say what these sheaves say what this notion is, and I guess in the course course of doing this, the notion of a pre sheaf is going to be here uh, as well. So okay, so here's the example which I said last week. So you have like a, a subset of R to the N, maybe your desktop, and you have certain kinds of functions, like say continuous functions. And I, we want to talk about continuous functions on this space. And I don't know, I mean, we really want to talk about, I don't know how to say this, but not just functions on the entire space, but we want to understand what does it mean to be have a continuous function on parts of the space. So to be kind of more precise, I'll say for every open set, I want to remember what the functions are. And I'm going to call it O of U. Uh, and this is like a curly, uh, a curly O. I mean, if you wish, in LaTeX, it's it, 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 it could be that or MathCal. Uh, what? Well, actually, I don't know why they call it O. I think it's a dumb thing to call it because it's. Uh, but there's probably some really good historical reason to call it functions O. Uh, but that's what they are. That's what people call them. It's not even. Yeah. What is there any language in which this would make sense? Maybe Finnish is the. Are there any? I think there's no, there are no fins, I think, watch it. So in which case I'm allowed to say that. But uh, function in Finnish starts with O. Um, and uh, so for every open set, I want to have the, I want to consider the functions on it. And I, and I observe that uh, the fall is that the, that we, uh, let me get in the habit of doing this, that we have a, that we have a, that we have the, we have, of course the, Functions on U form a ring, uh, and uh, so for every U we've got a ring. Um, and I somehow want to don't worry about the fact that there are functions on U. I, the real thing to remember is that it's a ring. Uh, so we have a ring for every open set, and we can restrict functions, even though I told you don't think of them as functions, to uh, to smaller open sets. So we take a function, we just restrict it. So that's reasonable notation too. And obviously, if you have a function on a big open set. Uh, you, and you restrict it, you want to restrict it to a small open set, you could just restrict it first to something in the middle and then to the smaller thing. So, so we're saying just that the uh, restriction, when you restrict and restrict, you can restrict all at once, and then you can write that in terms of this. And at this point, we've defined the appreciate. And why am I saying this? Uh, it's because it's something which deserves a name. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, and it's late, later we'll worry about, it may be relevant as to, why it deserves a name, but that's what appreciate is. But functions satisfy two additional properties that are going to matter to this. The first is something that's called the identity axiom. So both of these involve choosing a for any cover of any open set, not necessarily into three parts, not even a finite number of things, but take take an open set and then cover it with these with a finite number of well, no, with a bunch of smaller open sets. And I'm going to observe about functions that if I've got two functions on my entire set. Uh, and they agree on each of the things in the cover, they must have been the original function. And hopefully that's kind of obvious that that should be true in this example. And then uh, in the case of, uh, then there's another axiom, which says that if we have a function on each, on each of these open sets and they agree on the overlap, then they really come from a single function on the entire, uh, on the entire open set. And then if the, these two conditions, Form an example of a sheaf, the sheaf of, of continuous functions. And the reason, and now I want to go back and uh, let's choose a different color. And I can now talk about 
the differentiable functions on your desktop. And then everything I say, do, I, I don't know if I even feel like saying it, but you have a ring of differential functions. You even use the same letter because in Finnish, differ, uh, differentiable functions are also start with O. Uh, and you have you can restrict differentiable functions, get differentiable functions on small open sets. They behave well, uh, that you can restrict and restrict. That's a pre-sheet. Uh, you can see whether two of them are the same by checking on a cover. And if you have a bunch of open uh, differentiable functions that are doing the overlap, they move together to give you a differentiable function. So that's that's the sheet for differentiable function. So that's uh, we can now make that precise. Uh, and uh, and all I'm doing is repeating things we said before, but just for language, this is gonna, we can have a sheaf of sets or a sheaf of rings or a sheaf of groups, just global search term replace. Um, and then for each open set uh, u of x, we have, I'll use the word set here, f of u uh, is gonna be a set, which we call the sections of f over u. So that's part of the data. And we also have the data of restriction maps, which we can still think of in the same uh, way as with functions. Uh, and, and it satisfies the same conditions. So, so far we defined appreciate the sets. Um, and uh, so now we're ready for uh, the two bonus axioms, uh, which is the identity axiom again, which is that uh, I won't even repeat them because they're word for word the same, whoops. Uh, they're word for word the same that, we, that uh, functions, uh, actually let me reinterpret them we, uh, as, as, as saying that uh, if you have a bunch of functions on open uh, on the parts of the open cover, there is at most one function they can glue to. Uh, uh, that, in other words, they could come from. Uh, so, in other words, if they if you you can have at most one function on you that restricts to 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 something given on each of these. And then the second one says there's at least one if you have this additional condition. Uh, so that's the there exists. And of course, with the at most one means that there equals one. So in other words, uh, so so that's why uh, this is the this is the logically kind of I think you should think of this as a prior, the uh, the uniqueness, and then the existence is the is the second, it has to be stated second. Uh, and it because it requires more information of this smaller thing. Oh, F restricted to U J. Okay, so I, I, I feel like I should, I can zoom up further questions because now is a good time for, like, so serious stuff potentially happen there or maybe after the examples. And I know there's a lag and Taylor is laughing at something. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, great, so, what's, so uh, maybe I will pause to let the shepherds tell me if there's something I should, uh, if, I, if there's something I should say. There is a question about your example of left forgetful bunker being an adjoint yep. um, about Z and Z mod 2Z seeming to have an issue with this. Yes. Um, yes. And my answer is the politician's answer. Of, I carefully did not say, that, right, so Z to Z mod 2 is like remembering if a number is odd or even, uh, and so you're forgetting everything else about the number. So when you say forgetful functor as Lamely as I did, and not defining it, uh, the uh, the uh, then you then you say things that are just wrong. So uh, so absolutely, that means that you should not think. Uh, I'm carefully not defining forgetful functor uh, in that example as a forgetful functor. So that's a really lame answer because maybe a good notion of what a forgetful functor is is you know it when you see it, or there, it's an adjoint to something where you get a better version of something. So like a uh, uh, an abelian semigroup, uh, you can sort of complete it to an abelian group in some natural sense. Like the positive integers, you understand the negative integers. Or the, uh, or the uh, integral domain, uh, you can expand it to have a notion of, uh, of a field of fractions. Uh, so, that, so that's not a definition. And, then, and I can reverse engineer it to be a definition by simply saying, calling something a forgetful. Well, I don't know. Is there a def real definition of forgetful functor? Yeah, maybe not. That's one I'm going to be careful not to define. It's something you just sort of use in conversation uh, and in polite company, you carefully don't ask these questions. Okay, having not answered that question, are there other not questions I can, I can not answer? Okay, I'm going to wrap later if you feel like it too. Uh, great. And then some more notation is you can define uh, sheaves of sets on X or join groups, and you might give a notation like this. 
And I should say, hopefully you're thinking category, like you're, if you're thinking categorically, you're thinking, you should say, okay, he's told me what the set, sheets of sets are, what are the maps of sheets of sets? And then as soon as you ask the question, you might guess the answer uh, that I'll hold off in a second. That, 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 this is how it drives you to think about the right thing. So great, so now let me uh, give some examples. And the first example I wanna mention are functions on a topological space, or if I said a functions on a, I don't know, smooth manifold, then that would mean the smooth functions. And you'll say, what is a smooth manifold? And I'll say, okay, don't ask me that yet. But maybe I'll say smooth functions on R to the N or, or uh, as, uh, as functions on R to the N as a smooth manifold. Uh, so that's one we've already discussed. But here's something which is a super duper uh, important example, which is maps. If you're talking about topological spaces, we'll talk about continuous maps. Uh, so we can say continuous maps to topological spaces, or we can have differentiable maps to uh, differential manifolds. What does all that mean? Now let's just talk about open subsets of C to the N. We can say uh, the analytic maps from one open set from uh, to a subset of C to the N from on something which is a subset of C to the N. So I'm saying that horribly. What I really mean to say is you have X, you have Y, uh, and I'm going to tell you a sheaf on X and the sheaf on X. Well, what are the? It's a sheaf of sets. What are the sections over this? What are, what's the set? It's going to be maps of u to y. And so to every u, we have a set of maps. And moreover, if you have, uh, if you have a, a, a map from u to y, it induces a map from v to y, where v is a subset. And you can restrict it even more to get a set map from w to y. So you, should, you can and should think through why it's a pre-sheaf trivial. Like why, once you think it through, there's nothing to say. And then secondly, if I have two maps to y from this open set, and I know that they're the same on this subset and this subset and this subset and this subset, they must have been the same map to me. That's hopefully reasonable. And then they for the viewability axis. So this is a very different seeming kind of sheaf, a sheaf of sets. And a variant of that would be, if you have a map from Y to X, uh, I'll give you a sheaf on X, which are gonna be, it's kind of like the previous one where I want sections of this map. So I want maps, what's a, what's, what are the section, what are, this is actually why the word section of a, sheaf comes into it, but it's gonna be confusing here. If I have an open set, what are the sections of this uh, over U? It's going to be maps to Y that are, that I guess I would say that whose composition is the identity on U, but this picture is what's telling me what's going on. It's, so to, for every U, I get sections of this, of this map that looks like this. And on a smaller open set, I get a section over that smaller open set. And then you should just, once you understand what it's trying to say, it should be straightforward that it's a sheet. Okay, so uh, three more examples, and these are all separately really important. Uh, uh, so the so if you have a map of topological spaces uh, x to y, uh, and you have a sheaf on x, so here's notation. You may want to write it that way. You have a sheaf on x, then I'm going to give you a sheaf on y, uh, and so. Uh, so, uh, so, and it's going to be what's called the push forward sheaf, and it's got this symbol. Uh, and so it's a sheaf. What's the definition? And then the later question is why is it a sheaf? You can think it through. Well, on an open set, U of Y, uh, what are the sections? We'll take the pre image, and that's the inverse of U, and look at sections of F on this, over, on this open set, and just declare that to be the sections of the push forward over this. And then if you have uh, a section over this big open set, and you restrict it to a smaller open set that's a pre image, well, you, you can restrict. And so, if you think about what everything means and go through the definitions, ideally not by writing 10 pages, but by walking around and being careful not to bump into trees, uh, uh, then you'll see that this is a sheaf. And this ends up being uh, a super important one. And then, here, that's a great way to get weird sheaves of rings. If you have a, you have a sheaf of functions on X. Uh, and you push it forward to y, it's still gonna be a sheaf of rings, but it's no longer a sheaf of functions in some sense. Okay, and the last couple of things, the skyscraper sheaf is something who's, uh, where if you have any open set not containing p, the sheaf, there are no sections. And if you have anything containing p, there's one section. That might be an example of that. That's something that's kind of like an indicator sheaf. Uh, and I'll let you read about that. And finally, the notion of a constant sheaf. 
um, and the constant sheaf, I really get confused by the name and think it should be a locally constant sheaf. But what it is, is that you have the topological space uh, and what's the, the sheaf of locally constant functions with values in, for example, z, but you take your open set and you want functions that are locally constant, that are integers. So, so this is just a certain kind of, this really is a version of sheaf of functions, it's just certain functions you're considering. Okay, so things you can ponder. Uh, great. So, uh, Ravi, there, yeah. there's a request for an example of a push forward. Ah, good. Let me give you, let me hold off for one slide, but that's an excellent question. If I don't answer it, then then I'll, uh, then it, it's going to be cheap to answer, but not cheap to say why you care. Uh, so, uh, so, so let me uh, hold off for, for just a touch on that. So, okay, great. So now we also want the notion of a category, uh, a, a map. So what are, what's a map of sheaves? Well, a map of sheaves, and this works just for maps of pre-sheaves too, uh, but also, uh, which is just that you should have on, for every open set, you should have a map and it should, uh, and it should play well with the restriction maps. And maybe you can try to think about why that's the, use, the only reasonable definition of how you might map sheaves. And maybe if you want examples, the first ones are going to be somewhat lame, but you could do something like the sheaf of differentiable functions and the, uh, and the sheaf of continuous functions. Well, every differentiable function is a continuous function. So you have a functor from the, so you have a map of, uh, so, so you have a uh, map from the sheaf of differentiable functions to the sheaf of continuous functions. That's somehow a forgetful map. And don't ask me what forgetful means. Right? anticipating the question. And now here comes an example of a push forward where a push forward comes up. And this is, ends up being, a, there's a lot in this example and there's not much to say. So it's when you just sort of think about and it comes up again and again. So here's a push forward. So if you have a map of your favorite kind of space, geometric spaces, manifolds, topological spaces, and if in doubt, just think topological spaces now or open subsets of C to the N. And you know, in this case, uh, and with say differentiable maps or C infinity maps. So you have a map, x to y. Then you have the sheaf of functions on x, and you have the sheaf of functions on y. And you have, you could push forward the sheaf of functions on x. And then what are the sections? Well, over y, over an open set here, you have the functions upstairs. Uh, and that, so that is a sheaf, maybe an odd sort of notion of a push forward sheaf. But I want to point out, that there's a map from the functions on y to the push forward to functions on x because every function on y pulls back to be a function on the preimage, right? I mean, if, if it's a continuous functions, then a continuous function downstairs pulls back to be a continuous function. Or if they're differentiable functions and it's a differentiable map, whatever that means, then um, uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, you get a differentiable function up here. Uh, and so you get, uh, so there is an example of various things. There's a, it's an example of uh, a push forward. It's an example of a map of pre-sheaves. We even, I should say, we can use the language of functor. We have a functor from the category of sheaves on X to the category of sheaves on Y given by push forward. And that's a good test of the notion of what functor means. Uh, okay, so that, I don't know if that answers the question. Jonathan, maybe now is, 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 has disappeared to, to ask the more, the correct version of the question, but we'll come back to this a lot. So right now, this is just an observation that, uh, that later on the question of what we even mean by differential maps is gonna be, we know what differential maps of maps from Rn to Rn are, and that's all that matters. But, okay. Okay, next notion that is really useful, that is also dumb, uh, which is the notion of stocks and germs of pre-sheaves. And here, the terminology and the metaphor is uh, is somewhat uh, lost in translation. Uh, maybe it's the notion of a so the notion of a germ of a function it's an uh, it's like wheat germ for uh, it's like there's like a it's an agricultural phrase not a not a COVID nineteen phrase. Uh, and so the so uh, uh, so I won't maybe try to. Give well stock. There's going to be a sense uh, of, of of what a stock is, uh, of like a stock of wheat. Uh, but let me just 
say something geometric, which is, let's say you and I have functions on X. Now we can talk about whether they are the same near X, uh, right? So you have a, so here's, here's X and here's a point P and you've got a function near P and, I, and I've got a function. I want to say, I want to count them to be the same. I want to know if they're the same near P. So let's make this precise. What does that mean? Well, you have a function near, uh, you have a function, maybe not on all of X, but it, but it's on some open set. That's the only possible move. I've got a function, uh, maybe defined on a different open set, but we can still know what it means for them to be the same near P. It means that there's gonna be some, some neighborhood where they're the same. So hopefully that's the only way to interpret uh, that. So we'll see how they have the same germ, the same little shred, that like locally they're the same. If there's an honest open neighborhood, I don't mean they have the same value, they're, it's an honest, actual open neighborhood uh, where they're the same. So that there we have a definition then. Let me make that somewhat, uh, let me make that precise. Um, uh, so now we, uh, so we, we say two functions of the same. So there's my sentence that we've already made sense of. So, so now let's say we have a sheaf on X and we have a point on X, P. And I want to define the germs of X near P. And, so, and they're in a, all the germs together form the stock of F at P. And okay, so these are words. And that's denoted F sub P is, is the following thing, which is what are the germs? Well, each germ is going to be the data, is going to come from the data of an honest function near P. So it's, you need to pick an open subset and you, uh, and you need to pick a function, a section, sorry, a section of F near there. So if you're thinking functions, a differential function of an open set, for example. But I want to say that there's some relation. And the relation I want is that your function and my function are the same, are going to be considered the same, having the same germ if and only if, or it's a definition, if and only if there's a W, I should say, so there's a W containing P and contained in the intersection, I guess, because that's where, so we can make sense of this, where your function and my function agree. And that's it. And it's equivalence relation. Why is that? You can think about that. Uh, and that's the, that's, I'm just making precise what we said last time. Okay, so uh, a couple things to, so the definition is done, that's it. Uh, and now you have to come to terms with it by, by stewing on it and letting it marinate in your head for a bit. Uh, so I come, some things to, to think about is if uh, you have a sheaf of rings on X, then, then the, so not just a sheaf of sets, then the, the the stock is also a ring. And what, so what do we need to do? Well, we know a ring is like a set with some additional structure. A sheaf of rings is a sheaf of sets with some additional structure. You can add and multiply and subtract uh, and stuff like that. And, uh, and so what is this? So we need to figure out how to add and subtract things here. And so I'm just gonna do this by, by drawing and we'll see if you are, how unhappy you get by me just drawing things. And so uh, if you've got, if we wanna add, two things inside here. Well, one of them we'll think of as being a section over this open set. Another might be a section over that open set. And when we add them, what do we get? We might as well just take the sum in the intersection and that's great. So that's how we'd add. But then you'd say, wait a second, you made a choice. Uh, and so what if I thought about the first function, I was thinking about with this open set. And the second one I was thinking with this open set. Uh, uh, maybe I get something different. And then we'd say, well, not a problem. We could have just, restricted, the first open set would be replaced by this, the second by this, and then the, well, at this point you can't see what I'm doing, but this is the walk around and try to figure out why it is that addition makes sense and ditto with multiplication and things like that. And once you do, you don't have to memorize anything. And second thing to ponder is that FP is gonna be a limiter or colimit of the sections over all the open sets uh, containing P. And that's good practice for what limit or code of which one of getting used to what this is the ah yes that's yet another example of a blank, and so I know that given any section over a, a, an open set I get something here, and that tells me that this has got to be colon. So there's a colon. Uh, set and then next I'll say if we have a morphism of sheets you can ponder why you therefore get a map of stocks and. Again, just think about the definition or think about colon. If you, then you could think about the definition or think about colimits. And now we have a functor from the sheaves of rings on X to the sheaves of rings, that, which is given by take the stock at P. 
So all these words you can put together in sentences. Uh, and now if you have like a, a space, a geometric space, we don't want a manifold is or a stack or anything, but let's say you have like an open subset of C to the N, uh, then I claim that this, that O, you have the sheaf of functions, O, uh, and then I claim that the stock of the sheaf of functions is a local ring. And this is kind of, this is another super important fact. Um, I remember uh, one of the great thing about like the algebra, about the first great group rings fields algebra class one gives is people always ask, and usually like the, the, the most astute people in the class ask at the end, uh, and it's a sign that you screwed up and trying to explain it to them. Or the best ones act, ask near the beginning, which is, okay, this formal stuff is really good, but when do we get to, real math where it actually connects to something. And the answer is actually all of these things connect to something. So I, I, you can very quickly, in fact, the shortest description of tangent space I know of, which he feels like it's about analysis, is through local rings, uh, is through algebra. So let me go back to this example. Uh, this is, again, super important to digest. Not much content, but, but super insight. Uh, so uh, so, okay, what does a local ring mean? A local ring means a ring R with only exactly one maximal ideal. And what's a maximal ideal? It's not, it, uh, uh, well, I'm, I know 90% of you already know, and, but I maybe disagree with the definition that most of you think is a definition. Uh, so I'll say in a second what the maximal ideal is, which is equivalent to this. Okay, so here's the ring, uh, O sub P. We already know it's a ring. And I'm gonna give you a map to the complex numbers where I basically say, uh, I take the element of the stock and I just evaluate it at P. So in other words, given any open set representing that stock, I get a function on that open uh, set and I can evaluate it at P and that gives me a complex number. So that's my map. And so uh, I have a map to a field and and that means those things, the functions, the local functions that have value zero at P is a prime ideal uh, because you multiply anything by a function at zero at P, you get something at zero at P. And it's even a maximal ideal. Why is it a maximal ideal? Uh, okay, now here's the definition of maximal, the real correct definition of maximal ideal uh, is, uh, well, almost the definition is anytime you have a map, a non-zero map from a ring to a field, that gives you a maximal ideal. Right? Every time you have a surjective map from a ring to a field, that is exactly the same as the data of a maximal ideal from, your, from the point of view of how it's normally described. Uh, and, the, and the connection is by way of the kernel of that map. So in other words, here we have a map to, here we have a map to the complex numbers. It's certainly surjective because the constant functions uh, are, are clearly functions. And so that means that the kernel is a maximal ideal. And why is it the only one well, the thing to convince yourself of is that anything not in the maximum ideal is invertible. And I'm gonna to try to convince you that's true by waving my hands in the air and, uh, and to try to convince you that there's nothing that uh, the reason, reason is geometric. So let's say you have something that is inside, uh, that is inside, that's a germ of a function and it's not value is non-zero. So when I say that, I've got to picture it as a, function on some open set. So G is a function on U. Uh, and uh, we're, and I, I want to say that one over G is also a function on U. And that's not really true because G might be zero somewhere. But wherever G is zero, wherever G is zero is a closed subset. So throw that out, shrink U to, so it misses where, where G is zero. And now it can make sense of one over G. And there we go. And that got its, uh, and it doesn't include P. So lots and lots, so that's nice and you can think of it, but, and we'll see that come again later on. In some sense, the Zariski topology secretly has arrived without us, without us uh, realizing it. We will, we'll see that later. Okay, now we're getting into the last, the last of this sort of technical series of definitions that I want to make less technical by having all examples of things, which is if you have a ring, you have the notion of a module. And a module, as uh, several people in several groups were discussing, it's like an abelian group with the action of a ring. That's really the nice, it's, uh, some, I, forget, I forget 
who, but a couple of people said this extremely explicitly, which is so much nicer than the definition you often see in, in textbooks. So what's a sheaf of, so you'd have the notion of the sheaf of modules over a sheaf of rings. So, and the sheaf of rings we'll call O uh, because I can think of them as functions. And you'll say, wait, they may not be functions. And I, and I should say my perverse answer is, I'm just gonna call them functions because they're sheets of rings. Uh, and so, my, so we know that an R module is an abelian group with the action of the ring R. And so a, I want, what's the possible definition of an O module? An O module has got to be, for every open set, it's a module. Uh, uh, that, that's an abelian group. Uh, and that's, the, that's a ring and it acts on it. But better than that, it should play well with restriction maps. So when you, uh, so, uh, so I'll say this commutes, but I, that, that's language and not something you understand in your intestine. So let me just do some examples to try to have you really feel what this wants to mean. Uh, so, okay, here's a great example of a sheaf uh, that we can talk about not really, about things we have not defined. So you already are happy in your head with the notion of a manifold, whether you know it or not and whether or not you can give a definition. So you have a manifold, there's your, there's a manifold. In fact, okay, it looks two dimensional, but it's actually 17 dimensional because I can't sketch it so well. And so on this, so what's a vector field on a manifold? Well, the idea, what's a tangent, what's a, the tangent bundle? Or what's a, uh, uh, what's like the tangent space? The tangent space is like at every point, there's some thing, there's some vector space. That, that you have a picture of what it wants to be. And we're not gonna define it now, although I may accidentally define it next day. Uh, so, so you have a little tangent space. I mean, I can't define it. We don't know what a manifold is, but you know in your head, you picture like this torus in space and you know what it wants to be. And it's a vector space. Uh, and what's a vector field? It's something like a, a, a vector field is something where you take uh, like a tangent vector at every point and you want them to vary nicely in family. So if you like the Harry Ball theorem uh, is all about uh, section, is all about sections of the tangent, uh, uh, is all about a vector field. So you have a picture of what a tangent, what a vector field is. And now the point I want to, and so for every point you have a tangent vector and they, again, very nicely, which is as ill-defined as with moduli spaces, but things very nicely mean. But, um, but one thing I want to say is if you have a vector field, and you have a function on your manifold, you can multiply the function by the vector field. So you simply, if the function is value three at this point, you just multiply that vector by three. If the function is value zero here, you multiply the vector by zero. And if the, since the function is nice and continuous, differentiable, whatever you're thinking about, and the vector field somehow should be two, then the resulting thing should be another. So in other words, vector fields on a manifold are gonna be examples of O modules. Uh, 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 of a module. Another example that's maybe dumber uh, or simpler is O plus O, just like two copies of O. Uh, and then you could, that's, and so just like in a ring, R plus R is a module or R. Uh, and then maybe yeah, now comes the example we've had before, which is that if you have a nice geometric spaces, and again, for now, I'll just say open subsets of C to the N, but imagine that you're talking about manifolds or all sorts of other things. Later, there'll be schemes and things like that. Any kind of geometric notion, any kind of geometric space, we want to make sense of something like this. Let me go back and update the slides. So, any, so I claim that this push forward is a module, is an O module as well. And all I mean by that is that if I were to take a, the, a, any function that's on the pre-image of this open set U, I could multiply it by a function on you, uh, right? I could simply take, like I, get, I have a function up here, a continuous function here, and I can take a continuous function down here, pull it back and multiply. So this means that this is an, uh, is an O module. And so this, again, this map, this, this, is, a sheaf, these, this is a sheaf of rings. Uh, these are both sheaves of rings, but it expresses this as a module over that. So that's something just to meditate on to see that the, all the examples you've had, the words you have fit together in a sentence and help you see how they fit together. And then you could ponder things like, if you have an O module, this should play well with respect to taking stocks. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, it's, well, you should have notion of a, you know what a map of modules is. So the question is, what is 
uh, a map of O modules, and it should be what you think it is. And you shouldn't have to memorize the definition, so you can ponder that too. And so that's where I want to, that's the stuff about sheaves that I think is enough to digest over a week. So just to sum up about sheaves so far, is you can have sheaves of, of, of groups, you have sheaves of uh, rings and anything like that you should be able to make sense of, sheaves of sets. All those examples so far are sheaves of, if you want to get fancy, uh, the examples I gave were all sheaves of things of the form sets with additional structure. But you could have sheaves of value in any category if you felt like it. So there's a notion of sheaf and stocks uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, functors between them. And uh, so they're essentially it's taking everything you knew before about categories, rings, and modules and applying them to free sheaves and sheaves. And then we'll, uh, uh, and after that, you are sort of ready to think about them. And then we can talk about them. Uh, and one of the things we'll do soon is, to, is modules over rings are really nice. They satisfy, uh, well, they're really nice for, for reasons I'll say in a second. Uh, and if we formalize it, we have the notion of an abelian category. And so now this is back in chapter one. And I want to tell you about abelian categories without, but remembering our slogan that we want, I, I want to tell you as little as possible, uh, but everything that's necessary. So what's an abelian category? Now, I, I've sort of promised that I would just give examples of things and then make a definition. Uh, that abstracts it. And in, th in this case, I'm not going to keep the promise because I'm not, not going to even tell you the definition. Uh, uh, but I think you, you will thank me if you learn the definition later. But was, uh, so, and I also will, I think, manage to do this without losing rigor uh, in anything that follows. So here's the thing you abstract. You first learn linear algebra, um, and you, you know about kernels and co-kernels, and you prove the, uh, actually, these things are probably called different things in different countries, but the Rank nullity theorem, various isomorphism theorems, the notions of quotients, zeros, image subspaces, sub, image, image spaces, subspaces, quotient vector spaces. And then later you learn about abelian groups. And you know that all the same words apply. With groups, not all the same words apply. You, you have to be a bit careful. You can't quotient a group by any subgroup. So that's something that doesn't quite fit the same template. So that's not on the page. With abelian groups, you know what kernels are, co-kernels. You have things that are called isomorphism theorems, and I always forget which is which. And then later on, you learn about modules over a ring. Uh, and they, again, have kernels, co-kernels. They have Homs that are, uh, they have, right, well, they have all these different notions, uh, which are already down here. And right, so you know all this sort of thing. Maybe I shouldn't say, but uh, I've said it in rings or vector spaces. But you know they work for modules. And uh, so the question then is, what, what is it that makes this work? We're going to want to use these notions, so we need to say what makes this work. And the answer is the following thing. Uh, so you could, I guess you could state some axioms. And then if you, uh, then what axioms would you pick? And I don't care if you pick the best axioms, so long as they're equivalent to, uh, you don't need the shortest list of axioms. So all you really are going to need is the fact that you understand all these things just for modules or for a ring. But for a future reference in life, if you want to know, there's a, you could try to formalize it. And then there's a bit of, it's not completely clear what the best, def, maybe it is clear now what the best definition is, but you could, so Rosendieck uh, is the answer to all sort of questions of this sort always uh, in his, in this sort of totemic paper and uh, called Tohoku because of the journal it appeared in, um, define a billion categories. And there's some ambiguity as to what axioms you want, but you could say things really parsimoniously so that everything you know about modules remains true. Uh, so the things you need to check are really fairly few things. You need to define zero, direct sums, things like that. And you're welcome to go read what it is. But maybe what really matters is you know someone else has done the details. And if you care, you could do the details too. Uh, and you know the facts about modules. And if ever we need something more than that, we can talk about that. But that's all you need to really know about a million categories. And, but in particular, well, maybe there's one more thing to say, which is in, to connect it with our categorical stuff, Kernels of maps of modules are, are, are limits. And maybe, again, I don't need to say what an abelian category is. Let's just work in the modules over a ring. This is going to be, these are going to be A modules. Well, I guess maybe a linguistic statement that's uh, some places rings tend to be called R, and some places they're called A. R is for ring, so you can guess what countries that, that tend to use that. And uh, I know in, uh, A is for ring in French. And so since Modern algebraic geometry is, is K 
came from France. That's why uh, the algebra geometers often have A's rather than R's. Um, and so, it, oh, and then this, is, so, okay, great. So if you have a, a map, uh, if you have a map of modules, uh, which I'm unfortunately calling A and B after just telling you rings are A, then uh, cur the kernel of this map, if you think about it, is the limit of this diagram. It's, a, it's that thing here, uh, it's uh, something here, so that when you map it, to, it map, has a map to A and a map to zero. Okay, the map to zero is kind of obvious, but this commutes, meaning that uh, it's, the, it's gonna be something in A that, that maps to zero. And it's universal with respect to that. It satisfies a universal property, use that in a sentence too, so that anything else mapping to A that gets mapped to zero in B factors through that. So you can, this is a great way to get comfortable with limits because you already know what kernels are. But because limits of limits, limits commute with limits, you mean, it means you have things like uh, that limits of kernels are kernels of limits. And you also have, because of Rappel, I'm going to say that so many times until it's firmly in my own head, right adjoints preserve limits. That means right adjoints preserve kernels. So you just know this for free because you once in your life figured out why that's true. And then similarly, as a good exercise, if you have is co-kernels or co-limits. And by exercise, I mean just state, make the, all the statements and realize what they are. Uh, and realize how trivial it is to go from the, to add the word co in front of everything. Okay, so uh, the, so at this point we oh I, I, so I it, it's uh, two minutes past nine here, and so now is a uh, so so now is a good time to basically end today. Uh, and I'm thinking that rather than uh, the thing to try is I will go on Zulip as well, and then maybe answer questions there. Let me, before declaring this over, uh, is, uh, let me ask whether, yeah, let me see if there are questions that are worth asking in front of everyone before people head off into the sunset.